For those of you who don't get to the university that often, welcome to the flagship university of the state of New Mexico. <laughs> And like any flagship university, the University of New Mexico places excellence in research and graduate education at the center of our mission. But we have an undergraduate student population unlike that of any other flagship university in the country. If you look at Hispanic students and Native American students, we're the only majority minority undergraduate student population at any flagship university. Forty percent of our students are eligible for Pell Grants. A large number of our students are the first to go to college in their families, or are non-traditional students coming back for an education after working and raising families for many years. And so for all of us here, our mission is to deliver a flagship quality education for our students. Because if you do that at my alma mater at the University of Michigan, you're not necessarily changing a whole lot because most of the people who get there are reasonably well prepared when they arrive because they've had all the advantages in life. But if we can deliver a flagship quality education for our students, we transform their lives and we transform our society. And there is really no other department that embodies that mission more than American Studies because it's a department that, from its founding, was committed to excellence and research on the diverse communities of this nation and on the diverse inequities in our society and, and tried to find practical ways to understand and overcome those obstacles. And from the very beginning, it's a department that has been committed to delivering the highest quality education to our students at the undergraduate and graduate levels, and in research that is meaningful for the communities that we serve. And so that's why having the opportunity every year to have an extraordinary scholar come and speak to us because of the generous donations of all that made this Joel Jones lecture possible, it just embodies everything American Studies believes in, everything the College of Arts and Sciences believes in, and everything that the University of New Mexico should aspire to. And I am especially grateful at this moment to turn over the mic to Vera Norwood, who was on her first day as Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, uh, was my first day as the Chair of the Department of Political Science here. So we started together. And I hope, and I, I always aspire to live up to the, the wonderful, you know, the wonderful job that she did as Dean. And, the way that she exemplified everything that we we're talking about is the values of this institution. And so it is my great pleasure to turn the mic over to Vera Norwood. I'm blushing, I guess. <laughs> um, and, and thank you, Renia, for, for a very nice welcome to your building. And thank you for providing this space. Um, it's, it's really terrific. Um, I wrote up some remarks because um, I feel like I'm on a bridge here to a, a lot of why a lot of people are here, and I want to make sure that I get everything said I need to say. So, um, a little over a year ago, with encouragement from the de then department chair, Alex Lubin, Ruth Baines, an American Studies PhD in 1978, took on the task of organizing an alumni group for our department. Where are you, Ruth? There's Ruth. Stand up. <laughs> for the last year and a half. She called me about joining the effort because we've been students during Joel Jones' tenure as head of American Studies during the 1970s, and we shared our sadness at his recent passing. In reminiscing about Joel's impact on us and our colleagues, we discussed the tradition he had begun of American Studies providing a space supporting new scholarship and teaching emerging, and, and teaching emerging from current social and political events. For Joel, most often it was students, their lives and concerns, who pointed the way to key questions and research approaches fueling what he saw as an evolving dialogue between the university and its communities, local, national, and international. 
He carried this passion for connections into his work in higher education administration, both on the academic side in the provost's office and in the student services side. It was apparent as well in his later career as a very successful president of Fort Lewis College. I think there was something in his obituary that people call the years he was a president of Fort Lewis as the Camelot years at Fort Lewis. <laughs> American Studies has continued to build on the tradition Joel established of developing the academic strengths of the department through engagement with current social and political events. Ruth and I decided that a key part of our alumni outreach effort should include an annual forum for alumni, faculty, and students, and the community to come together to reflect on a critical issue of the day. After receiving blessings from Joel's daughter, Cammie and jo jo daughters, Cammie and Jocelyn, who both live in Albuquerque, and his wife, Rochelle Mann, we launched the effort to fund an annual lecture in his name. And I'm happy to say they are all here tonight. If you guys want to raise your hands or stand, that would be lovely. Okay. <laughs> It's a testament to Joel's legacy that a large group of donors, including former students, his family, colleagues, current and previous department chairs, every one of them, and even some of Joel's former handball partners, generously got us this spring to the $25,000 required for an endowed lecture fund. Many of these folks... folks are here tonight, and I think we're, we're doing that right now, we want to give them our ha heartfelt thanks for their support. We also want to thank Maria Wolf from the Alumni Office and Margaret Ortega from the uh, UNM Foundation for respectively providing support for getting the alumni group going and helping us get this fundraising effort put together. I want to also note that the Alumni Association provided funding for the wonderful reception this evening as well. I hope you all enjoyed the food and drink that they provided. <laughs> and finally, I want to also note that our work for the endowed fund has only begun. At its current level, the fund will generate about $900 a year for the lecture. So that we could launch the event this year, the chair, David Correa, provided additional department funds and located co-sponsoring departments. And alumnus Suzanne Owings, I know, where is Suzanne? Here I am. Ah, there she is, <laughs> up the top. Alumnus Suzanne Owings, in, in addition to a lot of other work, generously provided housing for Roxanne while she's here. And I hear she very much likes her housing, too. Um, <laughs> ideally, our goal is to have the fund fully support the lecture. So please consider, consider making a donation to continue this effort. Every gift counts. You will see in your program a short, short bio about Joel and a photo, um, as well as one of his poems. It's one of the more whimsical ones about teaching. If you're interested in reading more of his work, every donor receives a copy of his book of poetry. This is way better than a coffee mug you get from you know, <laughs> one of those radio stations. So think about it, a book of poetry, if you make a donation. Thank you all for attending this inaugural lecture and our current department chair and professor and wonderful supporter of this event, David Correa, will now introduce our speaker. You can't have that. <laughs> uh, I promise I'm the last person you're going to have to listen to before you get to listen to Roxanne. Um, uh, welcome to the uh, Joel M. Jones Annual Lecture in American Studies. Uh, my name is David Correa, and as the chairperson of American Studies at UNM, it's my honor to introduce the inaugural speaker in this event. Um, before I do, um, let me start by briefly thanking the many alumni who made this possible. <clears throat> in particular, and I know they've, a few of them have already been mentioned, but I want to mention them again. Ruth Baines, uh, Vera Norwood, Suzanne Owings, uh, Shelby Smith St. Clair, and Diane Layden, who worked as a committee over the last nine months, meeting regularly to plan this event. Um, this really could not have happened without them. In addition, I want to also thank Maria Wolf from the Alumni Association and, and Margaret or or Ortega from the UNM Foundation for their work and support in this effort. Um, and 
I also want to thank our co-sponsoring departments. Many thanks to the Department of Native American Studies, uh, the Department of Chicana and Chicano Studies, and the Women's Studies Program, whose support made this event tonight possible. Um, tonight's speaker, Dr. Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz, is a great friend of the Department of American Studies. This is not the first time we've invited her to speak at UNM. In fact, the last time we invited her to speak it was in this very room, right, Roxanne? Seven, six or seven years ago, right? And I hope it won't be the last. Um, she holds a PhD in history from the University of California, Los Angeles. Um, she spent 30 years teaching at California State University, East Bay, where she co-founded there the Department of Ethnic Studies. Before that, she briefly worked at UNM, where she served as the visiting director of Native American Studies, working with Joel M. Jones, among others, to establish Native American Studies at UNM. It was, uh, for many reasons, it was a no-brainer to invite Roxanne to deliver the inaugural lecture in the Joel M. Jones lecture series. Dr. Dunbar Ortiz is not only a scholar and award-winning author, but a committed activist. Her memoir read, and by the way, you probably saw all of her books outside. Um, if you bought one or plan to buy one after, Roxanne will sign those for you after the lecture if you'd like. Just want to make sure you know that. Um, her memoir, Red Dirt, Growing Up Oki, tells the story of her life in uh, growing up in Oklahoma. The child of tenant farmers and a grandfather active in the Oklahoma Socialist Party and Industrial Workers of the World. Oklahoma has changed, Roxanne. Um, <laughs> like all great scholar activist, activists, her work emerges from and informs the political struggles in which she has participated. Um, from 1967 to 72, she was a full-time activist and a leader in the women's liberation movement. Um, she tells that story in Outlaw Woman, memoir of the war years, 1960 to 1975. In the early 70s, she organized with the American Indian Movement and the International Indian Treaty Council. Her book, Blood on the Border, a memoir of the Contra War, tells the story of her work in Nicaragua following the Sandinista Revolution. In addition, she is the author of many other books, The Great Sioux Nation, an oral history of the Sioux Nation, Roots of Resistance, a history of land tenure in New Mexico, uh, my favorite book of hers, um, and Indians of the Americas, Human Rights and Self-Determination. Roxanne's award-winning book, An Indigenous People's History of the United States, was published by Beacon Press in September of 2014, and of which she told me today, um, will figure prominently in filmmaker Raoul Peck's HBO limited series on colonialism. You may know Peck from his Oscar-nominated film about James Baldwin, I Am Not Your Negro. Um, she co-authored the 2016 Beacon book, All the Real Indians Died Off, and 20 Other Myths About Native Americans, co-authored with a graduate of the American Studies program at UNM, Dina Helio Whitaker. Um, just this year, City Lights Books, pu books published her book, Loaded, A Disarming History of the Second Amendment. All of those books are available upstairs for you to purchase. She is working on another book for Beacon Press, uh, which I think she will discuss tonight, um, that challenges the idea of the US as a nation of immigrants. I am so pleased to have her here. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Roxanne Dunbar with you. I have to hold this, huh? I'm going to get your bag. I have to hold this. Yeah, no, I have to it. hold this. Make sure you talk. I know. Okay. Gosh, there are a lot of people here. You know, when I have these handheld things, I tend to drift away, you know, kind of like that, because this isn't, this isn't amplifying. This is for them. So hold up your hand. You'd yell at me if I drift away. <laughs> I get carried away. So I have to correct something that I hadn't even noticed in the, um, in the publicity about me, as uh, Joel and I did not found the Native American Studies program. It, it, not at all. It came out of the student protests and all of the 19, 1968, you know, the usual 
thing that, that these programs came out of. Um, the problem was that the university was beginning to um, pull away from support and all. So this is the people who did found it, Joan Ella and others, actually um, persuaded me to, you know, to come and, and take this position. So uh, what we actually did found was something different. It was uh, called the Institute for Native American Development within the Native American Studies. So I was corrected by Richard Griego, my friend here. Who <laughs> the original founders, are you here in the other? There you are, well, Richard is, but I mean, Janelle is not here, not okay. Anyway, thank you, Richard, since I hadn't noticed that. So um, I will tell you what we did, though. <laughs> you didn't found it. Um, I really, um, I too want to thank um, the American Studies Department and the members of this committee that have done such a great job of organizing this event and obviously getting the word out. The first thing I saw about it was it is everyone is invited who's either in American Studies, faculty or students, and uh, it got bigger, so they got a bigger room. So thank all of you for coming. But I um, uh, thank some members. The members are Ruth, um, Ruth Baines, uh, Alex Lubin, Vera Norwood, Margaret Ortega, uh, Shelby Smith Sinclair, and Maria Wolf. So thank all of you. I also wish to thank the co-sponsors of this event, the Department of Native American Studies, and the School of Architecture and Planning. As well, um, the institutional support that makes possible this lecture series, um, the UNM Alumni Foundation, individual donors, and um, the uh, um, UNM alumni. So it's a great honor for me to be the first speaker in this important series. Um, it's uh, more than um, a big honor, you know, to come back here and be able to tell the story and see how much uh, UNM has changed. It was a pretty white citadel when, in the 1970s. And um, so I'll, um, um, I want to say a few words. Um, about Joel before I get into the, you know, the, uh, what my lecture is really about, which is called Settler Colonialism, Immigration, and White Nationalism in the United States. So I think everyone who knows about Joel uh, and will learn about him uh, are deeply impressed by his scholarship and leadership in the field of American studies, but also his impressive administrative work here and then at uh, Fort Lewis, and then his poetry on the side. So he's a, um, an amazing person, but I think very few people know um, about his, um, his important role uh, for developing Native American studies uh, to um, another level um, at UNM in his position in administration in the 1970s where almost all money went to football and not to academic, <laughs> it seemed like anyway, um, until there was a great scandal. <laughs> so I was a, actually a witness and a collaborator um, to Joel Jones. Uh, sometimes, you know, um, acrimonious relations. Uh, I was talking with um, Harold Bailey, who was then uh, the director of African American Studies, because you know they had a struggle as well, and um, Joel would resist. But what he insisted on is that we we make the arguments that he would take to the president that he couldn't he couldn't conceptualize you know what it is that we were doing. So um, it he was he was such an important uh, link. So I came down here, uh, took a, uh, I was actually already teaching at Cal State University for four, I've been there four years, and I took a leave of absence. Uh, I wanted to come as a visiting director so that I didn't have any um, conflicts of having to, you know, make tenure or get rehired or publish a book. I'd already published two books, you know, but 
the history department didn't consider them real books because they were um, <laughs> propaganda. Uh, <laughs> the Great Sioux Nation, yeah. <laughs> so so um, I didn't want to have to deal with any of that. I was already tenured at Cal State Hayward. I had a secure position. I wanted to be able to walk away, you know, say, no, I, I won't. Where, you know, it's, it's really a trap a lot of times for assistant professors to, without tenure, to, you know, be able to um, have any weight at all. Well, it turned out, you know, there was um, so many people involved. Uh, it's hard to name them all, but the thing that I, I thought of um, that would be good is to, is a research institute because Universities are, you know, the most prestigious thing in the university is, is research, of course. And state colleges, like where I taught my career, don't have that, it's the teaching. But the research, you know, it, you can always add the academic thing, you know, the teaching and the courses and all later. But to have a grounding in a research institute with publications, um, which Vine Deloria had co-founded at UCLA, the American Indian Research uh, Center, is still going today with a publication unit. This was the kind of model that I was thinking of. It had just gotten started itself. Uh, so that's what I had in mind, but beyond that, I was, you know, just wanted to consult with everyone down here of what, what was needed, you know, what would be most useful in the community especially. So, um, really got immediate community support from the All Indian Pueblo Council, uh, Peterson Zah, the Dene Legal Services, who later became, it was kind of the opposition to Peter McDonald and became, um, won the chairmanship in 1983. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so they were very, very active. John Redhouse was around, you know, always available, talked to students and, and um, advised me in lots of meetings at the frontier and some bar down the street, I can't remember <laughs> which one it was. <laughs> and um, then um, the involvement of Denny uh, uh, economist Al Henderson. Is Al here by any chance? Al teaches up at Den Dene, but he lives down here. Al Henderson was uh, amazing. He had gotten his um, master's in, you know, in the, in the um, um, business school, economic. It, and he's an economist. And the Dene artist, writer, and intellectual, the late Her uh, Larry Emerson. And the wonderful elder economist, uh, the late Phil Reno, who was a mentor to all of us. He taught at the Shiprock Campus um, Navajo Community College. And um, then the Native American faculty on campus, which is very few but very important, engineering and in education. Of course, Alfonso Ortiz was here and he was very supportive. So, um, We also had the support and guidance from Vera um, Norwood that you, you have heard speak already tonight uh, in American Studies, um, and, and uh, Richard Griego, who's here from the math department, but was always, um, I remember, got me that computer that I never figured out how to use. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, we did, um, but it was Ted that really brought in the computers later. Louise Lamphere in anthropology, the late Gerald Boyle in business school, and uh, Harold Bailey, whom I, I mentioned, was a uh, great support. We had our little cottages over on Los Lamos, those little adobe cottages. So there's one for black studies, one for Chicano studies, and one for Native American studies, and the International House, so we were our own little little cluster there and very uh, mutually supportive. Um, so Joel Jones was our essential link to the UNM president who would have to approve, you know, a research institute. I believe at that time, it, uh, uh, and I was told, I think that it's still true that the legislature has to actually approve as well. So 
it's um, uh, not that easy to get a research institute and a university. So the, um, the core of the research institute was to be linked with an, uh, indigenous nation building and particularly grounded in um, here locally in, um, in New Mexico. So we began with what was conceived as a three-day seminar on res reservation economic development, inviting the economic development officers from the Diné Nation, um, the ver various pueblos, quite a few of them, and Zuni, Mescalero, Hickoria. Um, but the word got out, we were gonna keep it very local, the word got out all over, so tribal planners came from all over the country Native and non-native, there were a lot of non-native, um, some good, some bad, some wonderful. Um, they all came. And it became so large um, that uh, it, it turned into a whole different thing than we were, you know, kind of a consulting thing that we're doing. What do you need? What can we, what can we set up here that would be useful to your work? Uh, but it turned out to be, um, a very important occasion. Um, a half day at the end, we kind of decided this after it was, we couldn't have done this without the business school, Gerald Boyle. Um, they had, they were already into, you know, into quantitative analysis, which was just beginning at that time. And um, computers were, you know, not as, not advanced. Um, but they developed a questionnaire um, that, you know, of what was needed and ran that through, you know, a program uh, and came out with, what well, we came out with a report. So it wasn't just computerized, they could also write in. We studied, you know, and typed up all of, all of the comments and everything. Everyone really participated in that very well. And that became a kind of grounding then we um, published and distributed this report, uh, as well as publishing an anthology of academic essays uh, called Economic Development in American Indian Reservations. And that included um, Phil Reno and Gerald Boyle and Al Henderson and uh, Louise, La uh, Louise Lamphere, um, um, myself and others uh, looking at you know, reservation development. Vine Deloria had a piece in it. And um, subsequently, we published a book on transnational corporations' interventions in Indian country. And then a book of uh, poetry and prose by Acoma writer Simon Ortiz based on his experience working in the jackpile open pit uranium mine at, Is at Laguna, which was still open at the time. It closed in 1980. And uh, it was very controversial. Then in conjunction with UNM Press, uh, Phil Reno's Mother Earth, Father Sky, Navajo Resources and Economic Development, which I recommend every, everyone to read. It's University of New Mexico publication. So um, based on these, uh, this needs assessment report that we did, and further consultation with university and tribal officials, planners, and activists. Um, there was a lot, a lot of a uh, Kiva Club was very active in it, you know, and, and obviously, you know, connected with um, with the communities um, and the uh, anti uh, uranium, you know, coal mining and uranium mining. Um, very early environmentalist actions from native people. Um, so it was a, a, a very dynamic process, very exciting. Um, so what we decided to do was uh, that we, we got requests for, um, from almost all the planners, is to have the seminars we were planning to actually go ahead and have them. So it got set up through the um, Gerald Boyle, uh, who was a very conservative older guy, you know, but he was so, uh, he's so helpful with all of this. And he loved Al, he'd been Al's mentor, you know, in, in uh, university. And I think Al was the first uh, actually academic economist, he was Native American. 
And um, so they, um, um, they actually sponsored the seminars along with Native American studies and um, uh, gave credit. If the tribal planner wanted university credit, they'd get it, but there was no tuition, no charge for them. So it was really an amazing uh, thing. So we started the seminars. Uh, we had, um, fortunately, in 1980, this guy here, Ted Hohola, came home to Isleta from this prestigious East-West Center in Hawaii where he had a PhD, the perfect person. And um, he probably could have gotten jobs all over the place, but he stayed, directed Native American Studies, and he was what I call a premature um, apple freak. <laughs> he, had, he had a deal with Apple. Apple was very little then. They had an educational department. And he was, you were on the board, weren't you? Yeah. So he brought, he got all these free computers for the Native American studies. So he's training, this is like in 1980, 81, training students, Native students in computers. So give Ted a hand. <laughs> And he set up this wonderful indigenous planning uh, uh, institute here in the School of Architecture that's amazing. So now I'll get my, get to, get to my uh, nitty gritty. So I'd like to address the thorny question of settler colonialism in a society that claims to be a nation of immigrants, with the obvious exception of the present commander in chief, I might add. <laughs> For the past year, I've been working on a new book, tracing the origin of and questioning the claim that the United States is a nation of immigrants. So I'd like to present some of these ideas, and I really would. Appreciate having your thoughts, you know, email me or if we have enough time for some Q&A. Um, because I, I'm developing this thesis. I am a historian and I believe in the ghosts of history that inform our culture as well as politics, whether we are aware of it or not. And unless these ghosts are acknowledged and courageously faced, with truth and radical institutional change, the society is doomed to continue spiraling into violence, fanaticism, aggressive wars, and continued cruel oppression of the descendants of the victims of the United States past and continuing behavior, not only here but around the world. As we speak, bombs are falling, US bombs are falling on children in Yemen. So in 1958, there's actually a beginning to this idea of the nation of immigrants. 1958, then Senator John F. Kennedy published a best-selling book titled A Nation of Immigrants. I forgot to get my prop out. Here it is. Still in print. Sold millions of copies. So, um, Everyone should get that and read it. It's, it's quite a, uh, I'll go through some of it, but um, this is um, now accepted, you know, at least in the liberal um, and academic world and intellectuals, this is a nation of immigrants. Everyone says, well, I'm an immigrant, I'm an immigrant. Everyone's an immigrant, you know, we're all immigrants. Uh, which kind of covers up, uh, 300 years, 400 years, continuing of settler colonialism. So it's a, you know, it's, it's like a adjustment, I think, adjustment to, um, to deal with 
having to desegregate, you know, all of those things, find new, new ways to have a pristine United States. So JFK was interesting because he was the first president actually born of immigrants. I mean, they were very wealthy immigrants, but um, they were Irish uh, immigrants and the first Catholic uh, president. And uh, you younger people probably just have no idea uh, of how Catholics were really persecuted in, in, you know, in the United States. The second Ku Klux Klan was actually formed in the 1920s to persecute Catholics and what they call the foreign born so um, JFK was, this, it was pretty, pretty amazing. So I think he had the sense, you know, of um, he really believed it, The Nation of Immigrants, very passionate book. And it's the founding text of The Nation of Immigrants. It was published uh, near the end of JFK's 1953-1960 term as U.S. Senator from Massachusetts, two years before he was elected president. What is most striking is the fact that Kennedy never mentions in this book, never mentions once Mexico or Mexicans or the border in the text, nor does he use any kind of euphemisms like Latinos or Hispanos or Hispanics or anything like that. But this was 1958, late in the period during which Mexicans were categorized as braceros. They were under short-term contracts, and although not in the shadows, they had no rights, nor could they even return to Mexico until their contract was completed. More egregious is Kennedy's omission of any mention of Mexico or the border in the fact that Operation Wetback, officially called Operation Wetback, was a federal government program that began during Kennedy's first year as senator and continued beyond his senatorial career into his presidency. Operation Wetback was a federal program to round up and forcibly deport more than a million Mexican migrant workers under the guise of their being undocumented. Sound familiar? <laughs> Mainly in California and Arizona. Um, and this is all, of course, within the Mexican territory that was annexed in 1848. In the process, subjecting millions of Mexicans, many actually US citizens, to illegal search and arrest and often mistaken deportation. All were deported far away from the border to central Mexico without papers, without anything leaving those who were U.S. citizens stranded without documents to be able to even return to their homes. So this was a repeat of the mass deportations of Mexicans in the 1930s, when there was a tight, uh, you know, like 40% unemployment. Uh, again, you know, about a million, million and a half, many of them U.S. citizens uh, deported. But that Kennedy did, was not aware of what his own government was doing, you know, at this time that he didn't even mention them. So Mexicans were not considered immigrants. They were considered bonded labor, practically. You know, they were not, they didn't have that designation as immigrants. So regarding the status of indigenous nations in this nation of immigrant scheme, um, Kennedy wrote, quote, another way of indicating the importance of immigration to America is to point out that every American who ever lived, with the exception of one group, was either an immigrant himself or a descendant of immigrants. So it sounds promising, doesn't it? <laughs> but <laughs> the exception um, being the Indians, and he continued, Will Rogers, part Cherokee Indian, said, that his ancestors were at the docks to meet the Mayflower. But Kennedy disagreed with this, although he admired Will Rogers very much, claiming that, quote, some anthropologists believe that Indians themselves were immigrants from another continent who displaced the original settlers, the Aborigines, unquote. This, of course, is the speculation of US white nationalists 
that those original aborigines were European, in fact. <laughs> this is really evil. <laughs> I mean, it's like the Turner Diaries, you know. You know. So a few pages on in the text is the only other mention of Native Americans. Uh, Kennedy refers to them as the first immigrants. And that, be, that got into textbooks, you know, in the, in the early uh, 90s. They were saying, having the first chapter on the first immigrants, uh, Native Americans. Of course, they had the Bering Straits thing. And, but he dismisses them as members of scattered tribes. Yet after denoting Native Americans as the first immigrants, throughout the rest of the text, he uses that first immigrants for the original European settlers in the British colonies. Equally unsettling, Kennedy includes enslaved Africans as immigrants. Although the book actually has that famous drawing of a slave ship with black bodies, naked, chained down on their backs, with scarcely an inch between them, packed like sardines, where half of them died on that transatlantic voyage, Enslaved Africans hauled in chains thousands of miles from their villages and fields, naked or with no belongings, forcibly denied their languages, customs, histories, and nationalities and freedom. Used not only forced and unpaid labor, but their very bodies considered private property to be bought and sold, soon creating a thriving legal uh, slave market, the total value of which in 1840 was of greater monetary value than all other property in the United States, including all the gold in circulation and bank reserves and all real estate. That's a pretty heavy thing. Capitalism in the United States was built in the cotton kingdom on the buying and selling of black bodies and even the producing reproduction in Virginia because the transatlantic slave trade was outlawed. So, but they're just, they were just immigrants. <laughs> so this idea that the United States is a nation of immigrants was hatched in the late 1950s. So I see it as a response to the post-World War II worldwide national liberation movements in Africa, the Caribbean, Latin America, and Asia. The decolonization, the possible end of European and United States domination. But in the United States, the National Congress of American Indians, NCAI, was founded in 1944 uh, by Darcy McNichols, Helen Peterson, and other longtime Native activists. African American attorneys were developing a strategy for desegregating public schools, while in 1951, more radical African Americans, uh, Paul Robeson and others of the Civil Rights Congress, petitioned the recently established United Nations with a detailed document titled, We Charge Genocide. It's an amazing document, it's online, it's easy to find. It's not a long text. And that was um, based on the 1948 UN Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide. Around the same time, Native American activists were contextualizing the situation of Native nations within the decolonization, um, national liberation, transnational context. Uh, so I think those of us who thought all that came about in the 60s or 70s or maybe even yesterday, um, don't give enough credit you know, to those pioneers who were doing this. And there is a book uh, that uh, traces all this many things in there I didn't know before by Daniel Cobb, Native Activism in Cold War America, The Struggle for Sovereignty. I highly recommend that book, very well written too, good to use in classes. Well, these cracks in the empire were an extraordinary phenomenon because at the end of World War II, U.S. society and political order was solidly and confidently a white republic dominated by wealthy white men who headed transnational corporations and, uh, and um, um, that 
uh, and the financial investments and reserves greater than any who had the financial investments and reserves greater than any country in Latin America. African-American descendants of enslaved Africans lived under totalitarian Jim Crow laws in the former Confederate states. And when they migrated trying to escape Jim Crow, they were discriminated against. When they escaped the South for Northern and Coastal Industrial Urban Series, they were stalked by urban police that resembled slave patrols and still do. And, and um, they, uh, they were completely segregated, legally redlined everything. So Native nations, um, of course, were in uh, uh, pretty dire straits during that period of time. Uh, Termination Act uh, had been 1953. Um, the idea of doing away with Native people entirely. Uh, on on uh, land bases that could not support life, so, so many people uh, younger people had to leave uh, to work in near or far away cities and creating the urban Indian population. And this was very intentional. They thought, you know, they will never want to go back or, you know, be um, involved once they see the bright lights of the city and so forth. Um, so it didn't work out that way. Um, while Congress began reversing all the New Deal reforms, um, the termination, complete erasure. Irish, Southern, and Eastern European, mainly Catholics and Jews, um, were still discriminated against, but had made great gains in being accepted as possibly acceptable citizens, or honorary whites. Um, on the West Coast, U.S. citizens of Chinese and Mexican descent were discriminated against, while U.S. citizens of Japanese descent were incarcerated in concentration camps, stripped of their property and citizen rights, and um, migrant workers from Mexico, of course, were being uh, deported. So white men dominated every level of the society. Even white women, uh, especially if they were married, had very few rights. They couldn't even have their own checking account, you know, bank account. Um, it were men and women, job segregation. Um, so um, it was really white men dominated. So that's why it's so extraordinary that this, you know, this jump in consciousness um, and it freaked them out. So that's how I see Kennedy. They brought Kennedy in there to, you know, um, kind of uh, make an adjustment. And that, that's what the United States seems in the past very good at. Um, instead, it, it just set off a revolution um, in the 1960s. So the actual explosion that cracked the White Republic was the 1954 U.S. Supreme Court desegregation of schools decision with former California Governor Earl Warren, who was the governor who initiated the incarceration of Japanese Americans, I want to remind people, uh, as Chief Justice. So he was no great liberal person, you know. So it was definitely, uh, you know, a higher, uh, the ruling class really saying, you know, we're going to have to adjust to some things. So within three years of the Supreme Court decision, the white nationalist John Birch Society was launched by Robert Welch, the wealthy heir of the Welch candy fortune in Massachusetts, along with others such as Fred Koch, the father of the current Koch brothers, um, who fund white supremacists and privatize everything and especially public lands and Indian lands, and um, uh, movements to end all government <coughs> benefits. But the Birchers, especially in the nearly all white Orange County, California, um, where they really took hold, and these were like suburban working class, mostly um, who had been uh, economic refugees from the Southwest, from Oklahoma, Arkansas, so-called Okies and Arkies, um, that had um, been able to move into the suburbs, especially with the war industry, to get jobs. 
and um, they moved into south south central uh, LA and really you know dominated dominated that place. And then as the African American population moved in there, they fled to Orange County. So that's how Orange County became uh, the amazing right wing place that it still is today. <laughs> So this was the counter-revolution that grew throughout the 1960s and 1970s that many of us who were active at the time didn't pay much attention to. I, I kind of did because I was at UCLA, um, 64 to 68, and you know was aware of, of Orange County. And of course, they got Reagan elected, they produced Nixon, this was, you know, they spawned all these things. But what they did was involve middle-class suburban white housewives uh, in letter-writing campaigns to lobby legislatures to take over school boards and other local offices, which continues today. This is how they creepily took over the whole education system. So every textbook that's um, up for adoption in schools, school boards across the country is determined by the Texas School Board today. And um, so this is, um, you know, they really knew how to organize. We could learn something from them. They actually thought they were imitating communist methods. <laughs> uh, but uh, they, so did the Ku Klux Klan. They had their, you know, their, um, uh, their cells and their, their clans, the, you know, the ones that arose in the 60s again. So, this first highly visible sign of the counter-revolution was the, event, the first really um, big outward, you know, where people took notice. And I was actually down here when I took notice. Uh, the counter-revolution was the evangelical anti-abortion movement that soared after the Roe versus Wade de Supreme Court decision to decriminalize abortion in 1972. As well, the rather benign National Rifle Association was infiltrated and taken over by a white nationalist fascist organization, the Second Amendment Foundation, founded in 1974 by none other than Harlan Carter, who had been in charge of Operation Wetback. So this is when the Second Amendment became a populist cause and public mass shootings became routine. So, you know, all of these things have a beginning and a process, and it's important to kind of know that. You know, how, how did these come, how did Trump come about? You know, if you know these things, it's not that, it's not that surprising. I mean, I was a little surprised, I have to say, but. Uh, <laughs> um, just because of the whole sex thing, you know, I couldn't believe that or someone who says, uh, I could walk down Fifth Avenue and, and shoot someone and nothing would happen. I just didn't quite think someone like that would be elected president. Um, so uh, I was as surprised as anyone else. So in the middle and late 1960s, while the US genocidal war in Vietnam raged, in order to maintain economic, political, military domination, the then liberal United States ruling class, you know, the Rockefellers and all, and his brain trust sought ways of responding to social demands while maintaining power and militarism. So they offered multiculturalism, diversity, affirmative action. These were all Nixon, uh, Nixon initiatives. And yes, a nation of immigrants. Ideology in response to demands for decolonization, justice, reparations, social equality, and into US imperialism. So that's what we got saddled with. And then that's being taken away, you know, of course. So in, intent, in an, uh, attempts to offset exclusive um, emphasis on pioneer history and winning of the West as the nationalist triumphal in, in, uh, interpretation, a nation of immigrants was said to make the United States the greatest nation on earth and in history which did not really set well with the white supremacists in regards to Mexicans, of course. Uh, for many, John F. Kennedy had been seen as the great white hope who could steer the ship of state under a liberal social order while maintaining the status quo. 
The military industrial complex was put into motion, just in case, remember Dwight Eisenhower, the militarist himself, expressing, you know, when he, in his last speech as president, his, his deeply held fears of, uh, he invented the term, military industrial complex, the mice. So that was all in place when Kennedy came in and he increased it, of course, and, um, and uh, um, ever since. So he also created the special forces, uh, the Green Berets at first, now there are all kinds of special forces, to carry out counterinsurgency in Vietnam uh, secretly. Uh, so war was on the horizon and burst into full-scale military occupation under Johnson and Nixon. So U.S. loss in Vietnam is the other element. A humiliating tucking tail and evacuating only added to the fears and distress of the white nationalists and accelerated the development of a distinctly right-wing white supremacist Republican Party that by the 1990s came uh, to challenge uh, and eventually overtake uh, every level of government. Uh, locally in many places, statewide, but uh, now the federal government. So um, this, rather than following, say, Jesse Jackson's advice, running for president in the 80s, instead the Democratic Party decided to veer right, you know, rather than, you know, because Jesse was very popular. He was winning all over the place, you know, and sort of like Bernie Sanders, you know, uh, but the Democratic Party um, blinked and we got Clinton. Uh, <laughs> and no more welfare and total incarceration. <laughs> so this is, uh, why not let the Republicans do it? So <laughs> despite surging, the surging of white nationalism during the 1980s, the Reagan-Bush administration by the early 1990s, the waves of immigrants and nation of immigrants narrative Kennedy had conceived was a consensus concept, and I think it still is, uh, as it has entered public school textbooks, but also setting off um, textbook wars over history standards, because the right wing um, wanted more pioneer history, you know, more founding fathers iconography. So in both the liberal and right-wing versions of the national narrative, there is a misrepresentation of the process of European colonization of North America, making everyone an immigrant, and it serves as the official story of a mostly benign and benevolent United States that masks the fact that the Anglo-Germanic settlers in North America were settlers, colonial settlers, just as the British, the Belgians, the French, the Dutch, the Spanish were in all parts of the world too, Africa, Asia, Latin America, and even here in North America. So it didn't end, you know, with the uh, U.S. independence. They carried on all of those structures and actually embedded them into the Constitution itself. So. Beginning in the 1840s, there was an influx of millions of indigenous Irish fleeing famine in Ireland. They're now called immigrants, thanks to JFK, but they were really refugees, you know, as so many are at the border now. They're refugees. They're not what you would call immigrants coming to, you know, to uh, make a million or uh, the American dream, that's not what the starving Irish were thinking. They were thinking a meal, you know, for my family. This was not, they were not uh, coming um, in, in that narrative of, uh, and, and most were not. The Eastern Europeans were often fleeing pogroms, Jewish uh, people uh, fleeing pogroms, um, even famine in Scandinavia in the 1840s. Uh, that, the U.S. went over and, and, and dropped leaflets in the languages there, especially Sweden was um, a terrible famine, and invited them to come, you know, and, and take Minnesota, which is Dakota territory. So you had that horrible genocidal war that Lincoln um, 
during the Civil War carried out um, to protect these Scandinavian immigrants who really didn't, had no idea what they were getting into. They had a one-way ticket and free land if they could go and take it. You know? So um, this was um, uh, the Chinese and Japanese uh, also uh, were driven by economic necessity, although Asian immigration was soon excluded. Immigration laws were not even enacted until 1875. There were no laws. It was just, you know, any white European was welcome, and then suddenly there were others coming. Uh, and that was the only thing it was, was a, a U.S. Supreme Court decision that declared that the immigration was the authority of the federal government in the Constitution. It, wasn't, it didn't really make any laws, it's just federal government. So the Immigration Service was not established till 1891. So since the beginning of the 20th century, immigration laws have been more about exclusion than about welcoming. And um, this, but this common narrative still dominated categories in the U.S., uh, categories as the United States as a nation of immigrants, really does, um, I mean, this is the work that Native scholars are doing now, being done in American studies here, um, and that is um, uh, the work of, you know, understanding settler colonialism, and this theorization and material that's coming out is absolutely essential, but it has to be also, you know, disseminated in schools and all, make it into textbooks. This is gonna be the difficult next step um, for people to understand that. Uh, my indigenous people's history of the United States, I find, you know, that people who never even heard the term settler colonialism or colonialism that was applied to the US except as you know, that the, uh, the War of Independence was to escape, for these white people to escape colonialism. <laughs> That's what they thought the colonialism was. Um, they get it, you know, it's like, it's like a flash. Oh, you know, it kind of puts some, makes things uh, a lot clearer. So I don't think we should be reluctant to, um, to you know, really talk about this all the time until it becomes a part of the zeitgeist, you might say. Um, so this, um, I'm gonna skip because, <laughs> good question. Um, I should, yeah, I want to mention, uh, I mentioned it, um, sort of, you know, in the beginning about um, Nation of Immigrants and Trump. Uh, on George Washington's birthday this year, the Trump administration's director of the United States Citizenship and Immigration Service changed its official mission statement and dropped the language of Nation of Immigrants to describe the United States, although not for the reasons that I object to the designation. On the contrary, it harkens back to the unveiled white supremacist Americanism, you know, the white republic. Although immigrant bashing is not new, it has become more fraught issue as it has crystallized and accelerated in the 21st century as primarily um, targeting Mexicans and increasingly Muslims. Yet, those who defend immigration, mostly metropolitan liberals and often immigrants themselves, employ the idea of nation of immigrants naively without considering the settler colonial history of the United States and the white nationalist ideology it reproduces. Such advocates were caught by surprise and shock in 2016 when media and stadium messaging of Mexican hating led to successful presidential election. I do think that's what it, uh, you know, was the crux of what got, uh, got him elected. You all probably weren't watching his speeches on TV. He still does them, these stadium speeches, Hitler-like. It's scary, you know, it really is scary. So the, the homogenization inherent in the concept of a nation of immigrants is, is further flattened when it comes to you know, um, 
uh, to Mexicans, the Mexican hating, in uh, generic and abstract terms like Latino and Hispanic are used as euphemisms for what is basically Mexican hating. No one's talking about the Peruvians or the Brazilians or you know the uh, Colombians when they say Latinos are being persecuted. They're talking about Mexicans and Central Americans. Yeah, um, semi colonies of the United States. So it's also you know with the Muslims they say it's a Muslim. Hating, but they really mean, uh, you know, the Middle East, uh, because the largest Muslim country in the world is Indonesia, and there's not much bashing of Indonesia. They're a great ally in the United States. So the elephant in the room of immigrant bashing is the U.S. border with Mexico. Not Canada, not every international airport in U.S. claimed territory, rather Mexico. U.S. slavers' conquest of the Mexican uh, province of Texas, beginning just after U.S. independence and just after Mexican independence, followed by the United States military conquest and occupation of Mexico, 1846 to 1848, led to the annexation of where we are right now, northern half of Mexico. So white supremacy and settler colonialism are embedded in that questionably legal and always unstable contested border. Um, a few early examples. In 1835, United States Army Captain Lemel Ford on a secret spy mission in Mexico, here in you know, New Mexico, which was Mexico, uh, reported back that Indian race of Mexico must recede before us is quite certain as that is the destiny of our own Indians. So in the following year, 1836, U.S. merchant Waddy Thompson Jr. on a trip into New Mexico, when it was Mexico, wrote, these Spaniards, and he meant Mexicans, are the meanest looking race of people I ever saw, don't appear more civilized than our Indians generally, dirty, filthy looking creatures. So that was the, uh, you know, that was the, the border, uh, what became the border then. So the most revered U.S. poet, Walt Whitman, I hope there are no literature people here because they hate it when I say this, but <laughs> he was an enthusiastic supporter of the U.S. war against Mexico. In 1846, Whitman pro uh, proposed the stationing of 60,000 U.S. troops in Mexico in order to establish a regime change there whose efficiency and permanency shall be guaranteed by the United States." Quote. He goes on, this will bring out enterprise, open the way to manufacturers and commerce into which the immense dead capital of the country, Mexico, will find its way. We pant to see our country and its rule far-reaching what has miserable, inefficient Mexico to do with the great mission of peopling of the new world with a noble race? That's your Walt well, Whitman, the most endeared poet in English literature, American literature. So Whitman explicitly grounded his view of um, Mexicans in white supremacy, writing earlier uh, the N-word, uh, say it, the nigger, like the engine, will be eliminated. It is the law of the races, history. A superior grade of rats come, and then all the minor rats are cleared out. You never heard that part of his poetry. <laughs> so an essential question for those of us who are scholars and activists in Native American studies is how to regard the arrival of indigenous refugees from US wars in Central America and US drug wars and NAFTA in Mexico. How to find a way to make possible that they won't choose to become settlers, that they are aware of native sovereignty. This could, of course, be a question about all immigrants to the United States. In Canada, there's an organization called No One is Illegal under the remarkable leadership of a South Asian immigrant, Harsha Walla. Um, that um, they actually have um, 
a, most of their immigrants are from non-European countries. They actually do take a lot of refugees. Um, and they, um, from the beginning when that was formed 15 years ago in Vancouver, the, the Coast Salish people there were totally involved in the process of educating these immigrants. And now that organization uh, exists all over Canada. We have nothing like that. Nothing, nothing even near like that. But we need it. I keep saying we need to get Harsha Walla down here, but somebody's got to be a Harsha Walla, you know, and start this. It was just her, she, uh, she just understood, uh, you know, from knowing Indian history, where she was in India, that what she was seeing was colonialism, you know, when she was a young immigrant. So who is an immigrant in the U.S. anyway? And I, I always have to get my licks in for this, so. Certainly not Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> my pet peeve. <laughs> British settlers, or descendants in the British settler colonies on the Atlantic coast of North America and the Caribbean were British citizens. They could move around anywhere they wanted. New York was a British colony. He came up to go to the great university there, Columbia University, because um, they didn't have any universities in Barbados where he came from. So they were Br British citizens wherever they went. So Hamilton, born of affluent British settlers in the Caribbean, slavers, relocated to the British colony of New York in 1772 to enter the prestigious Columbia University. But the blockbuster Pulitzer Prize winning Broadway play Hamilton the Musical based on Ron Chernoff's best-selling novelistic hagiography of founding father Alexander Hamilton is a 21st century reenactment of the nation of immigrants, nationalist ideology. The creator of Hamilton the Musical, the really brilliant, um, musician and, and playwright, Len Manuel Miranda, who was born and grew up in New York in a wealthy Puerto Rican family, presents himself as an immigrant, identifying with Chernoff's Hamilton. When he read the book, he said, oh, that's me. And that's why he decided to make it. So uh, this then totally obfuscating the reality of Puerto Rico as a US colony, first of all, but whose residents have been U.S. citizens by birth since 1917, free to live anywhere they wish in U.S. jurisdiction. They can live in Guam, they can live in America, Samoa, they can live in anywhere in the United States um, or any U.S. military base. They're, you know, they're, they're just like any of us who are uh, just citizens. So in that way, Manuel and Hamilton are similar, but neither were immigrants. So Ron Chernoff, who has a new book out on Ulysses S. Grant, he does a hagiography every couple of years. They're big door stoppers. He's the author, he's the author of the best-selling Hamilton. He's not trained in history. He has a, a graduate, undergraduate degree um, in English. He, he's kind of a journalist, but has been well rewarded for his hagiography of founding fathers and wealthy capitalists. He won the 2011 Pulitzer Prize in American History Book Award for his hagiography of George Washington. He's also the recipient of the National Book Award for nonfiction for his celebration of US capitalism in his book, The House of Morgan, an American banking dynasty and the rise of modern finance. And that's why he liked Alexander Hamilton. This was the architect of capitalism, you know, that, uh, of all the founding fathers. So his 2004 biography of Alexander Hamilton and his 1998 biography of John D. Rockefeller were both nominated for many awards. So I'll end here, we need to ask ourselves why in the early 20th, first century, an invented biography of a founding father, an architect of US capitalism, Alexander Hamilton, by a hack journalist, was so enthusiastically embraced, especially by liberals. And it, I don't know, has anyone seen it? 
don't. <laughs> but because I'm including this chapter in this new book, I had to go see it when it came to San Francisco. I almost threw up sitting there. But, oh my God. And they're bringing school children, you know, they have now have lesson plans around it. But I, you do know, I think, that it, first of all, it was hip hop. This was what made it popular with young people. And he's very good at writing hip hop, uh, Lynn Manuel. But all of the founding fathers are played by black actors. And there are no slaves. It is so weird. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> also Hamilton, by the way, was, he's, he's also portrayed in that book and by Lin-Manuel as an abolitionist. He was one of those ones who, who hoped that slavery would end and all of the people of African descent could be deported to Africa. People who've been here 300 years, go back 300 years. So I don't call that abolitionism, you know. <laughs> that's, um, I call that, you know, very deep racism. So that's what all the founding fathers were, you know, in this, uh, this so-called anti-slavery society in New York. So they make a big thing of that. The fact is, he was married into one of the biggest slave trader families in, uh, in, in North America, in the colonies. That was uh, the Scheider family, the old Dutch, you know, the pre British slavers, the Shilers, and um, they're the ones that took over um, uh, the Seneca land of, of what Buffalo, New York is now. That, that's where they were. And Alexander, a member of the family, actually did the books, you know, for the buying and selling of slaves. So that's how much of an abolitionist he was. I hope I've discredited that enough that. <laughs> I'd like to, I do think it's something we have to think about. Why was that so popular? It still is, you know, it's still playing on Broadway. There's a best selling book that costs like $40 that I was forced to buy <laughs> to read it. That's a best seller on the best seller list, and Chernoff's book is constantly on the best seller list. So I just think we have to think about that. But I would like to end on a, a quote from Eduardo Galeano. Community, the communal mode of production and life, is the oldest of American traditions. He's talking about the whole hemisphere. He's the Uruguayan. It belongs to the earliest days of the first people, but it also belongs to the times ahead and anticipates a new world. Capitalism, on the other hand, is foreign, like smallpox, like the flu. It came from abroad. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you can run around. We have time for some questions if you have any. So thank you for all of the information. It's very layered, and I think that's so important in our time to understand how complex the stories were, how they all weave together to be where we are now. Um, I'm wondering, with the amount of knowledge that you carry and um, backstory that you're aware of, what is it that gives you hope, and where are the cracks for us to widen um, as we face what we face on so many levels, I don't need to repeat what they all are. Thank you. Well, that's always the problem, you know. What, what are we to do? That's why I, I read the uh, uh, Eduardo Galeano report. I think we have to keep that in mind that there is something, um, say, in this, you know, in this land, in the Americas, that um, 
whole cultures are so deeply rooted and they have not gone away, how can we nourish? How can, I, I mean, it's being done. I, it's the Red Nation people here, you know, the, um, it's, uh, I think things are being done and we just need to keep doing them and doing more of them more intensely and louder mouths, not to ever be, <laughs> talk louder, speak up, speak up in class. When I was uh, here in 1978 to 80, there was one native a graduate student in the history department, a wonderful scholar who's at the University of uh, uh, Arizona State University now, who, who built native studies there, um, James Ridingen, who's Pawnee from Oklahoma, brilliant. Richard Ellis, who was the Latin American history professor, well, one day, uh, James, came, he's, he's a big guy, 6'4", big, big guy, you know, I mean, he's like a, yeah, like a pony, you know, really a, a hard scrabble guy and um, very, you know, reserved and he was crying. He came into my office crying. I, oh my God, someone in, in his family must have died or something and he said he had just come from the graduate seminar where Richard Ellis had said that the Pawnees, knowing full well that James is a Pawnee, and this is his advisor, his dissertation advisor, or cannibals. So, you know, he couldn't at that time think, he was so horrified, he just ran out. He wanted to quit school, you know. But we have to speak up, you know, and not just Native people speaking up. Everyone has to interrupt the, I, I doubt that something that, well, I don't doubt anything anymore that could be done, but, <laughs> but to, you know, just make it a part of your, uh, the most important part of your life. That's what I would say. That's the healthiest way to live, basically, is to be involved in this making change. And we have so many uh, apocalyptic kind of crises ahead of us that um, we shouldn't get freaked out by that and think we have to hurry, hurry, hurry all the time, but keep nourishing this because something else uh, has to be reformulated to replace this, uh, um, decon you know, in the deconstruction, we need to be deconstructing um, colonialism, what it is, and. Uh, spreading this, you know, because it, uh, we multiply. Everyone we talk to, whoever it is, you know, uh, and explain these things and talk to them, they may not accept it, seem to accept it, but what I learned from years of teaching is that, and, and learning myself, that something I wouldn't accept, that years later I would say, ah, I heard that back then, that's what someone, you know, a mentor said, and I didn't understand at the time. So never think it's a hopeless case just because, you know, someone, well, you know, ignore the trolls on Facebook, I'm not saying <laughs> everyone, but um, yeah, that's kind of vague, you know, I know, but I think it, it's, it's actually that we, Red Nation is a really good model, I think, for the kind of uh, collective organizational structure, um, I hope, it can, you know, sometimes things uh, like what happened with AIM being local at first, very much, you know, uh, uh, a precursor of Red Nation was very local in Minnesota and Minneapolis, became national, it became, you know, spread really fast. So I think it, it is important to spread it, you know, have chapters, but do it really, um, you know, really with care and education and, and you know, create these, these kind of communist cells <laughs> that right we uh, love so much <laughs> um, that, that do letter writing campaigns and, you know, do intensive things. Give people things to do, you know, not just to, sometimes we are in our heads a lot, you know, and I think most people want to do something. So what can you do? Well, I say you could support Red Nation, and you could join Red Nation. Um, and they do great work with the, um, with the uh, uh, people without housing here, many of whom are, are Diné people on the streets here, and of course in Gallup. And I think 
Uh, where's Jennifer? Did she go to she go home? She left. Oh, she left. Well, anyway, Jennifer Dennis Daly uh, was doing that work even before you know before Red Nation formed, and so it was kind of a foundation that was really great. So I would say you know I've always felt this uh, that New Mexico is a um, is a a place of knowledge. There's knowledge here, historical knowledge, has several kinds of colonialism, it has, um, you know, the, uh, just the, you know, the, the ancient teachings of the Pueblos that are so deeply rooted, um, that it is the place that could ignite something. I think it is the most likely place of what you're doing here. I've felt that for a long time. Um, and um, so I think you have to really carry that burden of responsibility, you know, that there are elements here that people don't have in other places where you can figure out things and, you know, teach other people. So it's a big, it is a big responsibility. And uh, I think most of you who are here are probably already doing that. So I'm preaching to the choir probably, but I just encourage you not to give up and not to, uh, the Cuban revolutionaries used to say, uh, never give up and never sell out. <laughs> <laughs> no se rende, no se vende. And that's not a bad uh, formula to try to follow. Yeah. Any other questions? There's someone up way up there. You get to exercise way up there. <laughs> yes, I had a question to one of the comments you made about um, the Irish were allowed to become honorary white people. And the question is the layers of white supremacy and how people who were given the opportunity to join that camp uh, seem to race to join it. And even within those of us who are oppressed, there are layers of white supremacy right. that we accept. And, you know, and since it's so tied to capitalism, and since so many oppressed groups seem to accept the part of that white supremacy that allows them to feel better than somebody lower on the totem pole right. of the hierarchy of white supremacy and racism. And I guess my question is, as you talk about how we're going to change the structure of things, how do we change that? Because it seems so powerful and so embedded, and now it's becoming a global thought. Yeah. Thank you. That was a good point. I was thinking of the, what the Zunis say about Estabanico. The first uh, white man to come was a black man. <laughs> But you know, this is it. You can become, uh, there were, no one is, everyone is compromised by colonialism. We ought to accept that. That um, it takes a kind of, what in AA they call it, you know, a, a complete uh, uh, searching of, of your, um, uh, of these things uh, that you have to, we have to keep looking inside ourselves because we're all susceptible. Uh, I find out, I find things, you, you know, all the time that I, something I just didn't think of, you know, that is extremely important. And um, it's so easy in this country, it's an easy place to, uh, you know, just be clever and cynical and hip and seem like you're, you know, you're kind of a rebel or something without really digesting any, it's all form and performance. And 
But I think most people, most young people, we have this younger generation coming up. I, I can't keep straight the X, Y, Zs and millennials and all that, but you know, these young ones that are coming up now in high school, um, they, um, I really think that they have absorbed a lot of what we have been creating, knowledge we've been creating in the last 40 years, that they don't necessarily know where it comes from, but they, for instance, even at Liberty University, that horrible uh, evangelical school where they get all the children of the evangelicals and you know they, um, they say, uh, well, they, they don't, uh, uh, they don't forbid the teaching of evolution, but they just teach it as creationism. You know, that, that's science. So that's the level. But they did a poll of these young students. They're, you know, like 18, 19 now, just last year. And every one of them, like 80%, had no problem with gay marriage, no problem with trans, you know, trans people, no problem with, uh, the only thing is they're stuck on is abortion because they, they see that as murder. And, um, but they actually are not buying the whole thing. So I think they're, even these young conservatives, if they can be gotten to uh, when they're young, I think I ended a talk I gave in, uh, in Chicago at the Socialism Conference in July with uh, uh, capture, their child capture the children. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the make off with all the, you know, these white children. But yeah, it, it's really sad. You know, there is a book, that how, the, how the Irish Became White by Noel Ignatiev. You know, he goes through it, he documented how it went from being, uh, you know, in, in, in England, they were considered uh, descendants. Uh, it's an evolutionary theory that was in the national science, the British science foundation at that time in, in the 1800s that um, evolution, Darwin's evolution was correct for some people. For instance, all of the Africans, dark people, and Irish were descended from apes. They came out of the mud. Uh, but, but Christian white people were created by God. And so Irish were considered savages. You know, they, you read any of that stuff at the time, the Cromwell, you know, the genocide and all, it's all use, use of racial language, of features. They don't look very much different from Englishmen, but the, they still had, you know, this and that uh, kind of imaginary features that they, they uh, pinned on Irish. So, you know, they were persecuted in the same way in the United States. They were considered a lower race of people. And they were really the uh, first colonized people in Europe. You know, that colonization methods they used on the Irish, they brought right to New England. It's all already in place, including the scalping, uh, the bounties on scalps, all of, all of those things were already in place from the colonization of, of uh, Ulster. And so that, uh, how the Irish became white is a tragedy, and of course, uh, many, many Irish reject that, you know, and, and don't play that role, but um, they were offered, they, they had to take whatever jobs they could, so the jobs that were available in the 1840s were slave patrols in the Cotton Kingdom. And that's the genealogy of U.S. police forces. So Irish got, you know, got into the tradition of being and police, uh, almost like an ethnic. And when I first moved to San Francisco, the whole, the whole police force was Irish. The whole police force, and, and all the firemen were Italian. <laughs> so it's, in 1960, it was really something. But so that you know, so that that kind of casting, you know, you take this kind of dirty work, and do it for us, and then you'll be one of us. So that's the American way, you know, and everyone's susceptible to it. So I don't think we should ever be um, so confident that we couldn't fall into that somehow, you know, that, that we have to check ourselves all the time and, and be very aware because we don't want to be that. Uh, and we, we want to convince people they don't want to be that either because I don't think they do really. 
but they don't really you know, have any alternative that they're really being offered that gets to them, you know. So we have to find ways to, uh, you know, to infiltrate their consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> Are all of you tired? You want to go home? I, I'm really happy to sign any books that you have setting up there, so feel free to um, buy books from the bookstore. And I thank you very much. I think um, I can talk forever. He wants to stay here all night, but <laughs> to be continued. Thank you.